Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a webinar, probably the first one this school year, and we decided to entitle it People Thrive on Love. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you whether you can hear me, whether you can see me, whether you can see the slide on your screen. Well, apparently everybody said yes, so off we go. My name is Mariola Borska, and I work, I normally work at the University of Gdańsk uh, in Poland. And uh, the experience I've got and the courage I've got to be in front of you today on this absolutely beautiful day, at least beautiful day in also is that I have experience with teaching at various different levels, different ages, and, and most of the activities, actually all of them, are the activities which I, the activities I'd like to present are actually activities tested on my students. If I were on the other side, sitting in front of the screen, on the last free Saturday of your holiday, I'd probably have, honestly, high expectations. You're giving your precious an hour and a half or an hour for, for a session which is on teaching and education. And this is the last moment when you're free to enjoy your, your moment without your pupils and without the school. But on the other hand, it's probably the last weekend or the first weekend when you're totally set on school and your mind is on a Monday class. So being a receiver, an audience of this presentation, I would probably expect something absolutely practical, something I can take with me and practice and test with my students. That's why the session is actually not a theoretical, sentimental session on I love you, no. Don't worry, it's not going to be like this. It's actually a practical guide to developing love, which are kind of a different aspect of love, which is empathy. I would like to start with, with just, just a tiny bit of theory, which, and this is the only theoretical part of our, my presentation, is explanation, according to Thompson, worked out in 2001, um, what is empathy? Mainly, empathy is the, an effective emotional response to another person. It's the understanding that you, that you show and that you give to another person. It's also the ability to take the perspective of, of another person, of the other person that you are with. So it's the, it's the ability to actually step aside from as if from your own body and uh, and get yourself into the shoes of the other person and being able to see the world through their eyes and once you've got that it's also a series of mechanisms that will change your behavior depending on how empathetic you are these three aspects of empathy i would like to develop later on in various activities. The first dimension of empathy is kinesthetic empathy, which means that you don't have to say anything. It's just you work with your body, with the whole body, your eyes, your face, your arms, and well, just, 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 just your physical self. So the Kinesthetic empathy means bodily response to other people. The second dimension of empathy is cognitive empathy, when you actually show understanding, the knowledge of another person. Very often it's going to be intuitive knowledge. It's just your intuition that tells you, hmm, I know what you mean. I know, I know what you would like to say. I can sense who you are. 
extremely broad aspect and something that it's not easy to grasp and to identify and something you have to work on. And eventually, the last dimension of empathy, once you have developed this kinesthetic, cognitive empathy, the change in your behavior. And what are we going to talk is some pro-social empathy, where you change your behavior because you understand other people. These three aspects of empathy will be developed into all kinds of activities that you can do. And I hope you can take them on Monday to school with you. I know that there are oh, over 2,000 people at the moment with us, and you teach in various schools. Some of you teach very young learners, some teach lower primary learners, some of you teach upper primary learners, some of you teach adults. How can we adjust, how can I adjust to all levels and all ages? The activities which I'm going to do are actually, the activities will, will work with children and adults alike, but it's entirely up to you to adjust the activities to the age and to the level of the group you work with. From my own experience, I know that you never ever teach just one type of group, and usually you, you have to address or adjust your teaching and the activities you have to various levels, various different levels, and the same goes for age. All right, so let's start. Let's start with the with the first type of or first dimension of empathy, kinesthetic empathy. I don't know whether you've tried this, but um, a teaching aid which is extremely useful is a little pebble. I usually gather pebbles over, over summer. The, these pebbles come from Britain, but Polish pebbles would be great enough, or any other pebbles in the country that you live. I choose pebbles which young learners can't really swallow because they're very small and pebbles which are kind of interesting in, in, in shape. Some of them are like this, some of them are like that. Um, and the pebble is, is a really a good teaching aid, light to carry, and you can do various things with it. The first activity, which, well, probably some of you in Poland might, might be already acquainted with, because I really like it, is the first activity that you can start your school year with, which means that you have a guessing game for your students. One pebble per pair is enough. You divide students into pairs, you give a pebble to a pair, and or if you have lots of them, you can have actually two pairs, one pebble for each student. And this pebble is put into the hand, they take it into the hand, and the other person has to guess whether the pebble is up or down. But before, before you, you try and find out whether I have put the pebble in this hand, which is up or down, you've got to look deep into my eyes. And you can actually read the answer, whether the pebble is up or down. Can you guess it? Up or down? Congratulations to the ones who said up. And then you change. Of course, the pebble is just, just a prop. And the most important thing in this activity is looking deep into the other person's eyes. Of course, with the learners who, who can identify left or right, you can go left or right. OK, my left or right. Congratulations to the ones who said left. And of course, the students can note down whether, whether they right or wrong in their guesses. And the ones who can guess 
they can say, yes, we're very good at reading what your eyes tell me. But first of all, it is important that students learn how to look into other people's eyes. It's not that easy. And there will be certain students, children, who will actually avoid that. Uh, normally, the, the activity will go to an, yet another activity, which is called mirroring. Uh, obviously, we can't do it, but the activity is very simple. You ask two students to stand facing one another. One student is the leader and makes various gestures. The other person has to mirror the gestures. Uh, various gestures, jumping, just waving your hand, um, raising your eyebrow, left or right. And it is important that mirroring is, well, as exact as it's, it is. And again, you don't say anything. So where is English, you might ask? Where is the English? But what we're trying to do is, especially during at the beginning of the year, we're trying to create conducive environment to learning. And a conducive environment to learning means the students feel good and they, they can show also their creativity with their movements. It is important that you break ice at the beginning. And this is one of the activities. Actually, the activity is extremely useful because According to scientists, somewhere there in our brain, you've got mirror neurons. And the mirror neurons enable us to mirror the gestures and understand the gestures of other people. The interesting thing is that, for, for example, when you feed a spoon feed a baby, giving the food, you automatically open your mouth, just, just, just like a baby will do. So mirroring is really important, a nice ice-breaking activity. I promise love. Let's pass on to feelings. One of the things that you teach quite early during the year is being sad or happy, terrified, frightened, or surprised. It's a very simple activity. You ask students to stand in a circle. All of them stand in a circle. It's probably for children for young learners more than for adults, but who knows? Um, and there is a second button in it, because what you do is, all students standing in a circle, circle cover the face. And you touch the person who will make a face, and when you say, go, they throw the face at everybody else. And people in the group, students, children in the group, will have to make exactly the same face. So, of course, I'm happy. But you can have various faces, and then you will actually find out that not all children can understand the facial expression and actually make the same face. You can name the feelings by writing down the names frightened, surprised, terrified. Um, what about the girls in my picture? I would say interested, intrigued. And throwing faces is a, an extremely good activity if you want to find out who in your group has got problems with, for example, autistic children might have problems with that because they're closed and they've got some deficiency apparently in the mirror neurons. The next activity which I'd like to present is, it's actually taught, I was taught by a six-year-old French girl. She arrived to Poland and the game that she really liked playing was guessing feelings. And obviously we kind of played, my French is not terribly good, but I managed that. She wanted to play feelings and the game, Stella's game, went less. Like as follows. She asked me, how does it feel? Or how do you feel when, for example, you see mm, Stella at the airport? And I said, well, happiness. And she said, yes. And uh, you can go on depending on the level of your students. For example, 
How does it feel when you see a dog chained to its kennel? How does it feel when you see a beautifully redone, redecorated building covered with ugly graffiti? How does it feel when it's all, oh, when it's a hot day and you've got nothing to drink? So feelings can be just, just your happiness, your sadness, but it could also be something more physical. And she loved playing this game, especially on a windy day when there were broken branches and trees that were actually broken, twigs broken by, by the wind. Oh, yeah, we, we felt extremely sad on that day. And then people compare whether they've got the same feelings about it or different feelings. With more advanced students, students can definitely ask and answer questions about possible feelings they can, they can have. Uh, one of the activities which helps extremely develop kinesthetic empathy is all kinds of clapping rhymes. And again, I can't do it now because I'm on my own. But once you're in a student, with your students in a group, you can start teaching with very, very simple clapping rhymes, going on to a more advanced clapping rhymes. At this point, I would like to refer you to some internet pages. I mean, once you get to the internet and you just tap in clapping rhymes, you will have all kinds of clapping rhymes from very simple to extremely advanced, usually presented by, by teenagers. And they're kind of cool, right, by teenagers. Uh, the two clapping rhymes, which, which I've got here, and the pictures come actually from Pearson uh, pages, because we've got some lessons which were presented. And once you get to the teacher training side of the Pearson, you might come across lessons for young learners, and these lessons will, will show how to use clapping rhymes. The first rhyme is an extremely old clapping rhyme. It's a sailor went to CCC to see what he could CCC. It goes like this. A sailor went to CCC to see what he could CCC, but all that he could CCC was the bottom of the deep blue CCC. And the reason why you do this is you get the, the other version of it is actually clapping. You will all find out on the internet. Um, the reason why we're doing this is you ask students to work together. The rhythm, the getting it in the, right, in the right pace, clapping at the CCC is extremely important. For the first time, you've noticed now that we touch. We touch. And the touch is important. This kinesthetic empathy through touch that you can have to get in the rhythm, in the right pace, is extremely, extremely important. We do it together and we have to tune in. And everybody in the group has to fit in into the rhyme. Um, this is an example of a more complex, a complicated uh, clapping rhyme, but everybody likes it extremely. Um, you clap hands like that, and it goes like that. Grandma, grandma sick in bed. She called the doctor and the doctor said, let's get the rhythm of the head. Ding dong, ding dong. But we do it together, all right? Let's get the rhythm of the head. Clap, 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 clap. Let's get the rhythm of the feet. Stomp, 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 stomp. And now let's get the rhythm of the hula hoop. Because it's for kind of teenagers, who like hook becomes, oh, can become quite sexy when you change the, the movement of your, of your whole body. And the real fun is that we do it together in the rhythm and the whole group can enjoy being together, doing things together, touching gently, reciting and the language comes into it and the language is also important well basically um this is what my session today is all about it's all about 
the kind of empathy that does not require saying, oh, I love you. No, that's not the kind of sentimental love. Is the is a love which means understanding other people, other students, and being understood. That's empathy. Oh, being in the shoes of others is extremely important, but at the same time, extremely difficult. This time, I've got a task for you. Let's move on to a bit different age. Actually, this this text, which I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read, was written by by a sixteen year old, quite advanced upper upper intermediate sixteen year old. But obviously, you can ask other students to do it, less advanced. The task was very simple. Describe yourself. Oh, very simple. Describe your day at the same time, but at the same time, quite boring, quite boring. But this particular boy decided to write the text as if he was somebody else. And your task would be to guess who this text was written by. It was only hypothetically written by. Oh, so once again, your task is who presents, who writes the text. And I, by meaning who, I mean hmm, not necessarily a human being. Every day is the same. I get up at five o'clock and start waiting, waiting until they wake up. I'm migrating from one to another but they are incessantly sleeping. At six o'clock, he wakes up. I want to say hi, but I always miss him. After getting up, he runs to the bathroom to take a quick shower. He doesn't care that I'm hungry. So I have to wait 15 minutes for my exquisite breakfast. His name is Kuba. I think they like him at home. They feed him well. He's not sharing with me though. And he's got an unbelievably comfortable air. I love it. I sleep there very often. After breakfast, it's time for a performance. I'm already half asleep, but with my one eye open, I follow his every move while he carefully chooses what to wear. He's always spending at least 20 minutes staring at himself in the mirror. Mom, am I looking okay? He asks. I'm afraid that's why he's always late for his Thursday's English lessons. But at least he's always color coordinated and elegant. After he leaves, I get into a nostalgic mood, waiting for eternity. I wish I could go to school with him, but I can't. Even though I try to run after him to the door. We really attach to each other. After all, it was him who found me in the forest 13 years ago, after I was left alone. Since then, we've been growing up together. After he comes back, he spends time with his funny orange ball, which I'm afraid of. He plays basketball since I remember, and he dreams of basketball at night. I wonder if he can play with his long hair so long, covering his hazel eyes. He's as slim as I am, even though he eats 10 times as much as I do. We can understand each other so well because there are so many traits of character that we share. Being lazy, for example. We spend whole evening doing nothing but listening to jazz and playing the piano. He's postponing all the things he has to do for school and he has to stay up late, which I personally don't mind. After all, the night is the best time of the day. Before he goes to sleep, he never forgets to give me my midnight snack. Then a couple of hours of sleep and the performance starts again. 
I wonder whether you can. I wonder whether you can guess who, whose eyes could I see through? And I hope everybody said it's cat. Yes, it was the cat. His name was Dips. And Kuba and Dips, seriously, grew up together. Um, you can ask your students to, to write such a text. Present yourself through the eyes of, of your cat, your dog, your plant. Why not? Ask hypothetically. Imagine what your mother would say, what your father would say, what your brother or sister or your best friend. How would they describe you? It is an important ability to step aside and actually try and understand what other people or how other people might see you. This is one activity that opens our students' eyes to people might have different perception and might feel different. Um, this time I would like you, I would, I would advise that you take your students to the garden in, outside your school, maybe to the park, neighboring park, or to the forest if, you, if you're on a trip. And the only thing you, you equip your students with is a, is a blank piece of paper and a very, very kind of soft pencil or crayon. Because their task would be to hug a tree. You hug a tree, you put your ear next to the tree, and you listen to what the tree tells you. Then you take a very, very gentle rubbing of the bark, and you have to be gentle. And this is, this is one of the things which, which you have to stress. Whenever you take the bark, the rubbing of the bark, be gentle. After you come back to the classroom, your task would be to write it down what you have heard. I've got a few examples uh, written by, by students. And they, were, they were about 10, between 9 up to 12. And this is what they heard. I am a poor tree. I used to be happy long ago. But when the carpenter was born, they chop all my friends. The people pick my little friend flowers. I am lonely. I'm afraid of people who can cut me down and of the acid rain who can ruin my leaves and of children who can break my delicate twigs. How about this one? I'm afraid of people. All right, this one is very similar to the previous one. You can have a read. Um, the interesting thing is that when you when you ask children to do this activity, my experience is they really listen to the tree, and they they identify. They're so empathetic with the tree they hug. It's different with adults. Very often, adults can't hear the tree. Adults would say. Relax. You need time to 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 rest. Life, take life easy, and so on. But they don't really listen to the tree. They don't really write something like this. I love people who are gentle and caring. I'm scared of children who break my branches. All the bad woodcutters will cut down the tree, and people will have no air. There are some children who strip, strip my bark and there is nothing to protect me. When I'm happy, I often cry at people. When I'm unhappy, sorry, I often cry, but people cannot see my tears. This is original work written by children who are, as you can notice, the, the, the English is not that great here, but it's quite good. So I would risk this activity with not risk, I would actually recommend this activity to anyone, to all kids, even if they write one or two sentences. The most important thing is that they, they try and feel what it's like to be a tree and how important it, 
trees, plants also have feelings. And if you listen carefully, you will actually find out. But even if it's a plant on your windowsill, what does a plant thrive on? Okay, water, minerals, vitamins that you can give to the plant. But does your plant need watering once a week or twice a month? It is important that they notice differences and the needs of other people. I guess this activity introduces them gently to, the, to this particular dimension of empathy. One of the things which I would recommend to upper intermediate, inter, well, probably upper intermediate students and definitely advanced students, um, I called it, or we called it, dramatic monologue. Instead of describing the life of the bee or the problems of bee decline, you can actually ask your students to present a dramatic monologue of a bee. The next pictures I'm going to show you, all the pictures come from expert, proficiency expert, and I used it with my proficiency students. And it was much more enjoyable than just describing the problem of bee decline. I'm going to show you a list of words, and with these words, which ones would you use in the dramatic monologue of a bee? Factory farming, organic farming, battery hands, free range hands, animal pollination, confined space, cost effective, nutritional value, to roam freely, welfare concerns, and best summer use. Most probably, well, the bee will talk about excessive pesticides use that kills them and how they, how. Animal pollination or pollination is actually stopped just because people use stupidly pesticides everywhere. And there is nothing. They, they just die or oh, I die in pain because I've got nothing to eat. Um, all right, a dramatic monologue. You can choose either a dramatic monologue of a battery hen or free range hens roaming freely in the garden. It's a lot of fun because once this activity uh, is in, in, in motion, in action, um, the students become more and more creative and more and more feeling and trying to see the world through the eyes of a hen, or perhaps a cow, and they have a choice. And automatically, you've got a nice communicative activity because they choose one, either a bee, or they choose a hen, this or that, a cow, this or that, and uh, the other person will have to guess who they are. Believe me, they do use the expressions you want, you, you have pre-taught, and this activity becomes an extremely um, powerful activity because it's, you can go on to, for example, presenting a dramatic monologue of even objects and trying to put soul into their body. All these activities are extremely powerful and they, they're extremely creative. And the language, of course, the language is there and the language that you practice is, is practiced in a more creative and in a more communicative way. Empathy. Empathy is not the only feeling which is connected to love. Mm, what is the difference between empathy and compassion? With compassion, very often say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that something happened. And, and that's it. And you go back. Very often you show your sympathy to people. Quite often you might even ask, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Whereas empathy goes much further because empathy means being able to feel and to see the world through the eyes of other people, being able to sense what they can sense. And it's not 
easy. I guess we all know that. At this point, I would like to suggest an activity which um, I was extremely nervous about because I took Elmer, the patchwork elephant, which I, I, I believe that a lot of you might know. The new thing for me is quite experienced teacher and was taking Elmer to an advanced class to students who are 20 or 20 plus. The first year university or the second year university students. And seriously, I was extremely nervous about it because obviously you, you don't want kids, well, students to think that, that you treat them like children. Uh, you don't want them to feel offended by presenting material, which is basically at the primary level, it's aimed at young learners. Yet I wanted to risk it. Um, obviously, I then asked them to color Elmer. Elmer is a story of an elephant that, unlike all grey elephants, was patchwork. And as you can see, oh gosh, it had all possible colours, and blue and yellow, purple, orange, black, and green. And if you work with young learners, you might ask them to colour the numbers. If you work with young learners, or second, or, or primary upper primary learners or lower primary learners you might ask them to explore elephants as such for example in this one the question that you would pose is which of the two elephants is an indian it's from india which one is from africa all right can you tell the difference what are the differences who's got smaller who's got bigger ears uh, apparently, Indian elephants are lucky enough not to have tasks. African elephants, unfortunately, have tasks. And this is the reason why they've been slaughtered so often. Obviously, Indian elephants have got smaller ears, African bigger ears. Why? This is something you'd like to explore, introducing an element of clear. Eventually, you will ask young learners to color the patchwork elephant or make different, different design, even, even more shocking than the original Elmer. We can't listen to Elmer at the moment, but I'd like to refer you to, once again, this is, this is Elmer by David McKee. Uh, on the internet, you can easily find the story and actually story beautifully animated and presented by professional reader. This is a story of an elephant, patchwork elephant, who lived in a, in a group of, in a herd of grey elephants. And he was the only one who was different. The recent question which I asked was, how will adult learners respond to Elma, a story for children? Is it possible to assess the levels of the reflection? How can diversity of reflection be assessed? To what extent students' level of proficiency affect, sorry for the mistake, affect the level of their reflection? Honestly, I was, I was, I was truly nervous when I first presented it to my students. The film lasts about nine minutes. And uh, we didn't really, we didn't work on Elma as such. We didn't discuss it in class. What I asked them to do is to watch Elma. Then the class was over. I asked them to write their own reflections, 500 words, which means that it was quite a lot of uh, thinking that has to go with it. Um, I specifically didn't ask them to discuss it because I wanted them to have their own reflection on the subject. There were 56 students involved. Uh, they were advanced, the, the level of English was advanced. And as I told you, the age was 20 plus. It was a quite, um, the topic that we explored was relationships. I did the, I presented Elmer to young learners. 
to lower primary learners and to upper primary learners. I also worked with Elmer with my teachers. And the teachers first they said, oh no, no, no. This is this is just a book for children. This is a story for children. But once we started discussing the problem of Elma, how it feels to be different in a homogeneous society, their eyes opened. At the end of the session, they all said, mm, it's definitely a story for adults. Let me have a show you what kind of reflections my students, my university students had on Elma. 25 students, which of, of course it doesn't adapt to 56 because some of them had just more than one reflection. So it repeated. I counted the number of times the same reflection appeared. The most popular reflection was, be yourself, don't pretend to be somebody else, because part of the story is Elma really wanted to be grey. So he found a bush and covered himself with with berry juice and and he turned into a gray elephant. But of course the rain came and washed away the berry juice and Elmer was a patchwork elef elephant again. So the most popular, the most common reflection was be yourself. Don't pretend to be somebody else. Accept who you are. Accept being different. Pretending to be somebody else does not pay. Except to be different. Oh, easy to say, isn't it? About 24, 24 students said, be different, just like Elma, because being different is interesting. 13 people decided to comment on Elma by saying, respect people, be tolerant. Easy, isn't it? We know how difficult it is to be tolerant and accept difference in a society which is homogeneous. 13 students mentioned that actually diversity enriches society. In the story itself, uh, all grey elephants enjoyed being with Elmer. And they laughed when Elmer was there. And Elmer was a source of joy. And, uh, and, every, and he was the one who joked a lot. But at the bottom of his heart, he was truly upset about being different. Out of 56 people, young people, only one person mentioned that people who are different might be oversensitive to how we react to them, that it's difficult to be different, that even though you show, you don't want to show that, that you, you're upset about this, you actually are upset, because at the bottom of the heart, it's difficult to be different. Out of 56 people, only one person said that. Two students compared Elmer to Forrest Gump. Only two students described the events and commented on each of the event. Whereas most students just summarized the story and had a bunch, one or two reflections on the story. Mind you, it was 500 words, which they were supposed to write. The four assignments, which I mentioned, the, the assignment which mentioned Forrest Gump, and the other assignment, which was actually more in, built in a more organized, in a more interesting way, were the assignments linguistically most satisfying. But all assignments conveyed to students serious reflections. Nobody laughed or commented that the film was childish or inappropriate for them. Nobody was offended by the fact that university students were, were given a text which is linguistically rather simple, although not entirely simple. I recommend that you try and use the activity with any level and actually any age, because it shows that our students need 
reflection and they need the thinking about what it's like to be different, especially in our times that migration is so popular and uh, so common actually, and it causes so many different problems. But I just wanted them to feel what's it like to be different. Eventually, once you've developed this kind of activity, starting from very simple, where there's no language involved at all, you might like to ask them about certain pro-social behavior, which actually is only possible if you understand the needs of other people. For example, when you see an old person who carries heavy bags, for example, when you see this poor dog chained to its kennel, to its kennel and never ever goes for a walk, when you, when you see children who want to play and they're actually stuck in one place and waiting for their parents, this pro-social activity, which arises just because you're more empathetic, is extremely important. The, this, this text is, is, I'm not going to read it, but I'd like you to just to have a look. Uh, again, this is an activity which, which I carried out with intermediate students. As you can see, the language is quite simple. And they, they're an international group. And spontaneously, they wanted a story, a story of a family, of a panda bear family. And they introduced the character, a dog. And there was an element of helping and making friends. In the first part, they just describe the family, who's in the family. In the second part, they 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 just introduce the the characters. One day, Panda Bear met a dog. Immediately, they became friends. The dog lived in the mountains too. It was a rescue dog. It always had a first aid kit with it. Panda's mummy and daddy got in, got very cross. They didn't want the baby to make friends with the dog. They didn't trust the dog. And, and the story develops. Uh, just to show how empathetic children are, this was also an element of clue. They just showed that they understood what Panda Bear family needed, what kind of food they ate, and so on. And all of a sudden, you've got this dog who was totally different. The story is actually goes on into a very, very dramatic story. Because in the mountains, high in the mountains in winter, an avalanche happened. The panda bear tried to run away, but the avalanche was very fast. And they cried, help, help. And you can guess who came to help. It was the dog, the rescue dog. The dog ran quickly to the valley and found mummy and daddy under the snow. He helped them to come up and brought them home. And they all became good friends. And again, at this point, I would like you to, to search the internet for very, very popular films. It happens that the most popular films are actually about, about cats, but they're also dogs, featuring dogs. And quite a few films will show dogs in need, cats in need, uh, how good Samaritans help them. Some of the stories are traumatic stories of dogs being tossed out of the car. I can't show them the film now because the, 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 the well, it's just a, a short lecture, but I, I guess you can easily find of course, it means that you've got to prepare some kind of a task. But even if the task is, how does it feel? Is the cat or the dog sad or happy? How can you help the dog? Even if it means that occasionally you would have to switch into your native language. I guess it is important. 
I guess it is important that you open their eyes to the needs of other people. And at the same time, you explore the material in English. Because some of you could say, all right, where is English in it? Because after all, we're English teachers. All the aspects, all the dimensions we've been talking about are the dimensions that enrich the environment that you teach. It just helps people to feel better in the group and gradually it opens this mutual understanding that any teaching can only take place in. If you don't have that, if people don't feel good in the group, if they don't understand the needs, if you as a teacher don't understand the needs, and the other way around, if they don't understand how it feels to be a teacher, which is probably an impossible task, but why don't you tell them this? Why don't you, why don't you say, well, look, this is what I need in order to be with you, and this is what you need in order for me to teach you. Um, all right, that's the end of preaching. And uh, I, I promise that we were going to have just practical activities and not any, any theory. But just the last bit of theory, um, because the, the question is, we teach us. So the basic or the fundamental question for us is, can empathy be taught? I'd like you again to refer you to the to the internet. Just look for there is a one at least one research which I personally found was the Berkowitz and Beer research from 2007, and the interesting thing is that it's a long longitudinal research, which is very rare in education and very difficult to carry out. And the research was on the impact of certain program. The program was entitled The Roots of Empathy. And after this longitudinal program, where students were exposed to activities, just like the ones that I presented today, documented that children involved in the program demonstrated lasting, lasting increase in social and emotional knowledge. And probably even more important, decrease in aggression. Increase in pro-social behavior. For example, sharing, helping, and including everybody in the group. The research, by the way, the research at the same time says that people who are excluded in the group are actually likely to fall in ill very quickly. It also it also resulted in increase in perception among roots of empathy students of the classroom as a caring environment. So it helped students feel good in the group. And it doesn't really matter whether you're 10, 15, or 20 plus, or you teach elderly students. The fundamental need of all students is to feel good in the group. It increased understanding of infants and parenting, which also means it increased understanding of teaching and learning. So empathy creates an environment which is conducive to teaching. Effective teaching doesn't matter whether you teach English, maths, Polish, Russian, or any other subject at school, which is extremely positive. I only quoted one research. I don't think there will, there will be many researches like that, but perhaps you'll find, perhaps you've got your own experience and you have, it'd be really nice if, if one day you could share that as well. Empathy can be taught and it is important that you, that you spend some time, 
even if it can't be tested in a traditional way, and even though it's not on the list of skills and abilities openly referred to in your, in your curriculum. All right, that's probably more or less the end of this session. Uh, I'd like to show you the bibliography. The, the book which was recently published in Poland, that's by Joachim Bauer, Empatia, co potrafią lustrzane neurony. I guess you probably, if you refer to the author Joachim Bauer, you might find um, more information about it in your languages. Um, empathy by Deval, right? The Age of Empathy, Nature's Lesson for a Kinder Society. Uh, that's a book that actually explores the problem of empathy and it shows that empathy is not only a human trait. Animals, especially primates, can also be empathetic. There is an article by Richard Prashner, but it's actually written in English. Can I refer you back to this internet page? And you can read all about mirror neurons. And if you need more theoretical background to it, it's in the article and some other articles about mirroring, about empathy. We've come to, to an end of our, of our session. Thank you very much for being with me. That's the beginning of the new year for me. And I wish you, I wish you good luck in the new school year. I wish you, that you have a lot of understanding students. And don't, don't hesitate to tell them that you feel nervous, that you feel how you feel, and tell them how you imagine they might feel at this very moment, at the beginning of the, of the school year. Thank you very much for being with me and good luck. <laughs>